So, uh, great to be back in Oxford again. Changed a lot since I was a student in the late 70s. Had a lot more nightclubs, by the looks of it. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about computer art, specifically about the computer art that I produce. And towards the end, after I've explained the processes that I use, I'm going to touch on some of the broader themes, such as the idea of the artist working in a laboratory alongside scientists. So these are the organic structures that I produce. This one dates from about 1993. It's a virtual form, it's computer generated, but has biological characteristics. These are other forms, the more recent from an exhibition I've had in Brussels, and these forms are dynamically changing in real time, and they're driven by an evolutionary process that I steer towards directions that I like. This is another version, maybe looking like something from a strange science fiction film made in Japan. Jumping back in time to about 1982, um, I was a student at the Royal College of Art, but whilst all my friends were producing strange paintings like Bastlets and Jackson Pollock, I was spending a lot of time in the Natural History Museum observing natural forms, such as things like snake skeletons. Uh, butterfly eggs. You know, the, the, the natural world is fantastically rich. So after spending much time in the Natural History Museum, I started to de devise evolutionary rules, and these were like drawing rules that would tell me as the artist what to, to draw. Um, here I am drawing these strange <laughs> evolutionary charts, that some of them which were about 30 feet long. I won't go into much detail, but it uses very simple transform so what I was using my, with my own brain as the device to imagine what effect that this transform would have on the form. And uh, these drawings became absolutely enormous and became a, a, a way of generating extremely rich variants. And so I'd created my own natural system, uh, a humanized version of what was, I saw in the Natural History Museum. The work was influenced by fractals, Benoit Mandelbrot's, work had emerged, and also Froebel building grammars, uh, which had been used by architects and mathematicians at that time. Also influenced by American graffiti art, Keith Haring, and also tantric art. A lot of the time in my work, I've looked to the Far East for inspiration rather than contemporary European or American art. And as these drawings grew in time, the work coincided with Richard Dawkins' work on the blind watchmaker. Before he got a little bit sidetracked later, his early work was absolutely fantastic. But what was interesting was that emergent content started to be produced by his systems. And also this reference Conway's Game of Life, where also you have gliders and other strange moving objects emerging from a system that appears dumb. I then became a research fellow at IBM and went from art school to corporation. So I found myself working in a laboratory and started a long-term collaboration with Stephen Todd, a, ma a mathematician. This was an absolutely fundamental phase. We had software that could join things together, render them in 3D, and quite quickly we threw away the old rules and de developed some new rules that produced things like, looked like animal horns, strange things you might find at the bottom of the sea, uh, strange eggs, and there was an underlying grammar. There were rules that we designed which determined the way forms would grow. Even webs could be created. But then what we did, which was a novel, was that we kind of built an evolutionary fruit machine which would take all those numbers and randomly change them a little bit and generate variants. On the bottom left, you can see a parent with its eight offspring. And the, so we then started to create these larger evolutionary ideas. So the idea here was that the artist became like a gardener, interacting with the computer, steering through a vast evolutionary space of possibilities. The interface that I used had things like breeding, you could say something was good or bad, and you can crossbreed, and you could crossbreed between multiple parents. And these were some of the forms that I evolved at that time. And this was an evolution driven entirely by human aesthetics. And some of the forms were extraordinary. However, this is a little bit like the Rocha inkblot test. The viewer perceives what they want in the forms, because the forms have no meaning of their own. And so with these variants, 
one was kind of exploring a psychological landscape. So when I was breeding forms, I'd always pick anything that looked a little bit Rococo, a little bit Baroque, anything that looked like Geiger. This is all my aesthetic, if you like, that was steering my evolution. Things that looked a little bit Paisley, things like green helmets, pumpkins, also look a little bit like viruses. These are all evolutionary selection criteria that I was using. The world of plants had a massive influence on what I would pick and breed from. But also heavy metal imagery. I don't like heavy metal music at all, but the imagery is fantastic. So anything that had a kind of heavy metal feel, I'd breed from that one definitely. Or maybe put it aside to breed from later or crossbreed with a plant-like form. And some of the forms look like they could be from an alien planet. Uh, quite, quite extraordinary, these are three-dimensional, you can spin them around, and they're continually evolving, they're always subtly changing shape. More recently, what I've been working on is a system where the viewer also takes part in the artwork. So the idea is that uh, in a gallery, someone can pick and breed from themselves. It doesn't require my particular aesthetic. People will bring their own aesthetic to the gallery, and that will influence the types of forms that they will evolve. So this idea of uh, the artist not being sacrosanct, but the public can actively take part in that work. So we're starting to do work, early work with virtual reality to take this into the VR space, so people will be absolutely immersed, completely surrounded by these 3D forms, particularly connected to Connect, where even subtle body movements would change the dynamic of the evolutionary space that they're within. So another question that we've been dealing recently with my collaborators is, what happens if you completely remove the human from the system? So this is some early work we've done where the machine has rules which decide which ones to breed from. So here we're seeing a set of variants, and it's carrying out a number of calculations using aesthetic filters. The challenge with this type of approach is it's fine if you can mathematically define what the rules are. So artists often are concerned with balance, composition, and those sorts of rules, one can, because they're mathematical, and this is the current set that we're using, you can program reasonably easily. The, the computer can calculate the numbers. And in this instance, the machine generates the variants, it picks its own winner, and breeds new variants. Well, what we've found, and the wider research reveals the same, what computers cannot do is see forms that have got rich content, things that look like griffins or witches' faces. The machine is completely blind to that. And maybe this is the area where AI and computer vision really needs to make a breakthrough. And it, and it seems you can computerize a certain amount, but still the human does actually have a role. You can't completely remove the artist or the public from the artwork. Some wider topics. So, for example, I've spent a long time working in laboratories with, with scientists. And so more recently, as a professor at Goldsmiths, I've been working with Mike Sternberg and his bioinformatics group at Imperial College. One of his PhD students had been a big fan of my work. Um, in particular, a lot of the structures that we're using resemble the ways that proteins actually are bolted together. So this kind of crazy art system for <laughs> creating evolutionary forms does some, have some similarities to the natural world. So, for example, the beta barrels that you see in protein structures has quite a lot of similar geometry to my forms that you can see bottom left. And we won a big BBLCC grant to develop a protein docking game that takes some ideas and th puts a different spin on it. And we now have a team working on that. So ideally, what one's hoping for is a kind of return to Renaissance art, where artists and mathematicians are working together, be it pr uh, programmers, engineers, experts in AI, computer vision. And this, to me, is really the direction that art should take. But what do we actually have right now? Well, we have a kind of form of art which is reduced to being a kind of form of real estate driven by Christie's and the gallery system um, with a kind of strange king-making process. Uh, if, something's, if something sells, it's good. And it's about time that this system was just removed and we finally got back to our roots and started to be truly creative again. 
So the role of the artist in the laboratory is very interesting. Um, there's a lot of pressure on scientists to be creative. Like st use of statistics has generated a lot of good rewards, but kind of the barrel's a little bit empty now. So one of the things that I find very interesting when I work with scientists in laboratories, be it at IBM, be it Imperial College, is that if, so, if you tag something as art, it can be very, very experimental because you're not hindered by the scientific method. So having an artist in the, in the team and anything that's just a bit too experimental, a little bit too wacky, you just call it art for a little while, um, is a really good approach. And I think that's one of the benefits of the artists within, within a, the scientific context. But to conclude, what is the big picture here? Well, if we're going to redesign nature, which looks like it's pretty much on the cards, it may take a little bit longer, ethics and aesthetics will play a key role in that redesign. So, for example, this is a, uh, an image by uh, a landscape design by, by Capability Brown. Every tree, every bush in that scene is designed. It's you're not seeing nature at work there. You're looking at a, a nature controlled by man. So if artists are going to work with scientists, they already have to be engaged with software. They have to be engaged with some of the tools that the, the scientists are working to enable that aesthetic element be injected into their work. That's the end of the talk. <laughs>